Hello again, and welcome to another edition of the Senate Reports. I am your host, Eric Coleman, and I'm also the state senator of the second senatorial district here in the state of Connecticut. I want to welcome you and thank you for viewing. For the next few minutes, we're going to discuss and explore uh, some of the happenings in the state of Connecticut at the legislature and in the community. And I want to offer just uh, my view and opinion on uh, some of the things that are transpiring. Uh, before we get started, what I'd like to do immediately is to send out my condolences to uh, State Treasurer Denise Napier and her family on the passing of her father, Connie Napier Jr. Uh, Mr. Napier was uh, a pioneering African-American architect uh, here in the state of Connecticut, as well as a, a member of the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, he was 93 years old uh, at his recent passing. And he was uh, obviously a contributor in many ways uh, in his professional life, uh, as well as his personal life. In his professional life, uh, we want to thank him for uh, the buildings that he built and the flights that he flew, as well as the barriers that he broke. And in his personal life, uh, we want to thank him for having produced an absolutely wonderful family and the prog progeny that will carry on uh, as he departs. Uh, on another uh, note, uh, a much more personal note for me, uh, the committee to re-elect State Senator Eric Coleman is uh, hosting a grand opening of the uh, campaign headquarters, which is located at 1229 Albany Avenue. And that uh, grand opening activity will take place on Thursday, October 6th from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, all of the community is invited. So if you have a spare moment uh, during those particular hours, uh, we'd love to see you and hopefully uh, you can stop by and even volunteer to participate in some of the campaign activities in support of not only uh, my re-election, but the election of um, all of the, the candidates that will be on the ballot. Uh, as you know, I'm a Democrat, so I'm uh, supporting uh, the Democrats uh, on the ballot, uh, including uh, Hillary Rodham Clinton and state, uh, I'm sorry, U.S. Senator uh, Dick Blumenthal. Um, other activities, community activities to take note of, uh, State Representative Brandon McGee is coordinating a political forum uh, to be held uh, this Saturday, October 8th, and that event will take place uh, on the campus of Trinity College from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, I've been invited to serve as a panelist on uh, one of those panels. Uh, there will be other legislators and uh, elected officials who will also be participating. I am informed, I believe that U.S. Senator Chris Murphy will be the keynote speaker uh, for that day's event. Uh, and there are others of my colleague, uh, Representative McCrory, uh, Senator Winfield, and um, uh, Senator Bai uh, from West Hartford uh, are a few of my colleagues who I know uh, will also be participating in the event. Uh, just to bring you up to date on some of the activities I am uh, continuing to be involved in at the legislature. I've been appointed to serve on two task forces. Uh, the first has to do uh, with legal counsel in civil matters. Uh, as many of you are aware, there is a guarantee for uh, legal representation in criminal matters. Um, there was a notable case, a landmark case, Gideon versus Rain Wainwright, which established the right to legal counsel uh, when you're accused of a crime. On the civil side of the justice system, there is no corresponding right. So 
particularly over the last few years, we've seen a proliferation of uh, people coming to civil court uh, without a lawyer and acting pro se. And that has, uh, as you might imagine, created uh, its own set of problems, included um, clogged court dockets, um, a backlog of cases, um, but even more importantly, uh, in unevenness in the uh, meeting out of justice uh, for people who have uh, either civil claims or who are being accused of civil, some sort of civil uh, liability. Uh, so the whole objective of this particular task force is to try and figure out ways concerning how to make certain that people's rights uh, um, are well regarded uh, and how we can uh, make provision for uh, those people who have to rely upon the civil justice system uh, in order to be ad adequately represented. Um, the other task force that I will be involved in uh, as a co-chair uh, has to do a task force on police training. And this particular task force is um, the brainchild of one of my colleagues, um, Joe Varenge, is a state representative representing West Hartford. He is a retired police officer. As a matter of fact, a recently retired police officer. And uh, Representative Varenge is an individual with a good heart and a lot of experience as a police officer. Uh, he was one of those who supported the uh, excessive force legislation uh, that we uh, pushed through the legislative process uh, a year or two ago uh, in response to all of the uh, police shooting incidents that were occurring around the country uh, and trying to make sure that uh, we were uh, taking the right steps to make certain that such incidents did not occur uh, in the state of Connecticut. Uh, Joe was very helpful uh, in that effort. Uh, and as I indicated, he's, he's a very decent uh, guy. His heart is in the right place and he wants to do the right thing. Among the things that he is concerned about is this recent trend toward the militarization of police departments. Um, and He's also expressed concern about the way police are being trained. There seems to be an emphasis on uh, the use of force and um, a dictatorial sort of style. Um, he thinks that there is room um, for a refinement of police training uh, with a greater emphasis on mediation and conciliation, which he thinks would be much more helpful, uh, particularly in regard to the restoration of trust uh, between police departments and um, the members of the community. Along those same lines, I have been involved with uh, a few other people uh, in an effort to host a series of community uh, community conversations on the topic of uh, police and community relations and the uh, excessive use of force uh, by police. And we've had uh, about a month ago a conversation at the Mark Twain House in Hartford uh, was well attended. Uh, I think people left, however, with the feeling that uh, simply the surface had been scratched. And so um, those who are involved in uh, particular um, gratitude and, and, and uh, applause should go to uh, Julianne Butler, who was the coordinator uh, of the first conversation. And uh, even though she's uh, scheduled to relocate to Washington, DC, she will be involved uh, in the next series of conversations. Uh, her commitment is outstanding and her preparation is very thorough. Uh, so uh, we look forward to 
addressing some of the concerns uh, that some of the attendees had uh, that we simply did not have time uh, to delve into uh, on that first conversation. Uh, but the whole intent of the second conversation will be to give the community uh, much more of an opportunity to speak and participate uh, in the conversation. Um, with that, um, we do need to take a break and uh, we'll take that break and then we'll come back with some more discussion and provision of information. Welcome back and thank you for rejoining us to our, the continuation of this episode of the Senate Reports. Again, I am your host, uh, State Senator Eric Coleman. I represent the second senatorial district in the state of Connecticut. It is a district that includes the towns of Bloomfield and Windsor, as well as the city of Hartford. And I proudly represent those municipalities in the Connecticut State Senate. Uh, right before the break, we were talking a little bit about uh, community conversations and uh, the desire on the part of many in the community to have some meaningful uh, dialogue concerning uh, the police role in the community, police community relations, and uh, what many perceive to be oftentimes the excessive use of force on the part of police officers. And I suppose, depending on uh, who you are and what your point of view is, uh, you may have a lot to say about uh, who's at fault along these lines. Unfortunately, uh, in many of the police shooting incidents, um, support for police or support for the victim and the family of the victim uh, seems to break down along racial lines. That is of uh, some concern to me and others. Um, and it seems that if uh, you are a person of color, um, your sympathy and your support would be for the victim uh, in most cases. Uh, and correspondingly, if you're a white person, uh, there seems to be an inclination to support uh, the police officers and to uh, exhibit some understanding of the police feeling threatened or uh, un under some sort of pressure. And, you know, I think it's tragic that the, the court system has borne out that it is extremely difficult uh, 
particularly in a criminal prosecution, uh, to secure a conviction of a police officer. Um, all of these opinions being what they are, um, hopefully we can all agree um, that it is wrong for police to be ambushed and murdered. Uh, no one wants to see that happen. Uh, as well, it is wrong for um, individuals who are being stopped for alleged motor vehicle violations or for some other minor infraction uh, to end up dead at the hands of the police. Uh, neither of those things should happen. And uh, it is not mutually exclusive or it shouldn't be mutually exclusive for people to feel uh, support for police officers and the difficult job uh, that they have to do uh, and for people to feel uh, a good deal of sympathy and empathy for uh, victims of police excessive use of force. Um, so uh, we were mentioning the community conversations, the series of conversations that are being planned uh, to have the community weigh in and express uh, their opinion concerning uh, these types of incidents and what can be done legislatively um, and from a policy perspective, uh, what the role of the community should be and what the role of the police officers and the police department should be. So we invite your participation as these conversations continue and uh, I'm sure if we all put our collective wisdom and effort uh, into the conversation, uh, we can come up with the appropriate resolutions. So as uh, many viewers should be aware, the legislature is, uh, uh, I suppose in recess would be the best way to describe it. Uh, we did recently have a special session uh, at which time uh, we took up the issue of um, a partnership with Lockheed Martin Corporation, who has just acquired uh, Sikorsky Aircraft. And uh, there was uh, in that acquisition some concern on the part of the officials in the state of Connecticut that Sikorsky Aircraft uh, would likely be relocating out of the state of Connecticut. And I suppose what added uh, some support to that idea was the fact that the contract for the production of the Black Hawk helicopter, uh, which Sikorsky Aircraft is involved in, was coming to an end. And on top of that, uh, Lockheed had acquired Sikorsky, uh, and uh, there is a new contract uh, for the King Stallion helicopter, the production of 200 King Stallion helicopters, uh, the prototypes of which were being developed in Florida. And so there was some uh, real concern that the state of Connecticut was in jeopardy of losing uh, if not the entire Sikorsky operation, the uh, bulk of that operation uh, and have it relocate to Sikorsky, uh, I'm sorry, to Florida, uh, where there is another Sikorsky plant um, that has already produced four King Stallion helicopters. Um, the contract for the 200 King Stallion helicopters uh, was being competed for uh, by Connecticut, as well as Florida, as well as uh, some other locations, Sikorsky locations around um, the country. And uh, the step that the state of Connecticut took uh, was to put together a package of uh, incentives, financial incentives for the most part, for preserving the 8,000 jobs uh, that uh, are connected to Sikorsky uh, aircraft in Connecticut. 
and that financial package included about $221 million of incentives. Um, and I suppose that the uh, leadership in the state of Connecticut thought that that would be a wise investment in as much as uh, it could yield approximately uh, $69 billion um, to the economy of the state of Connecticut. When you think in terms of all of the suppliers and vendors uh, who do business with Sikorsky aircraft, um, uh, who would lose that business if uh, Sikorsky were to relocate to Florida or some other location. Um, the package of incentives also include uh, sales tax uh, credits and uh, deferrals um, and other tax uh, benefits. And hopefully that package will be sufficient or has been sufficient uh, to cause Lockheed Martin to uh, view Connecticut as the site where the, the contract for the King Stallion helicopters um, will be awarded. Um, it is a 15 year partnership between the state of Connecticut, Lockheed Martin, and Sikorsky Aircraft. And over the course of those 15 years, uh, 200 King Stallion helicopters, which is a uh, uh, sort of a heavy duty uh, helicopter, a helicopter that, for example, would be able uh, to lift uh, a military Humvee and uh, transport that equipment uh, to whatever site uh, is desired. Uh, so many people, uh, including myself, who is usually, I am usually opposed to an economic development strategy, which merely gives large amounts of money to major corporations. Uh, but in this instance, um, in combination with our attention and support for small businesses and entrepreneurship, uh, this uh, particular step makes sense to me because I think uh, unlike in some other cases uh, where the state gets bluffed by major corporations threatening to relocate, uh, this was a real situation. And because the state of Connecticut has a long and um, I think many would view it as a successful history with Sikorsky aircraft. It made sense to me and uh, many of my other colleagues for the state to weigh in and offer uh, this package of financial incentives uh, in order to influence Lockheed Martin and Sikorsky to make the decision to remain uh, a significant presence uh, in the state of Connecticut. Okay, we've reached a point for another break, so uh, we'll take that break and then we'll continue with this conversation.
Welcome back again. I am State Senator Eric Coleman, and I want to thank you for being with us for this episode of the Senate Reports. Um, I don't suppose we can have uh, any segment purporting to convey information without having some sort of comment on uh, politics at the national level. And uh, regarding the contest between uh, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, um, I think if there wasn't such significance attached to uh, that contest, uh, it would be rather amusing. Uh, and I say that because, um, take for example, the recent debate between the vice presidential candidates on that ticket and uh, all of the pundits saying that uh, Mike, Pen Mike Pence made the better presentation. Um, I disagreed with the analysis of most of the pundits, although I would say that uh, the inclination on the part of Tim Kaine to interrupt uh, on a number of occasions was sort of irritating to me too, but I thought substantively uh, he spoke uh, in a manner that indicated that he was well prepared and that he was knowledgeable about what he was speaking about. Um, on the other hand, I don't understand how uh, anybody can view uh, someone as winning a, a debate uh, when that person was involved in uh, deception and evasiveness uh, and outright uh, blatant mistruths uh, during the entire course of the debate. Um, I suppose if you're looking merely at style, uh, then perhaps Governor Pence deserves some uh, some consideration as being the prevailing party in this particular debate. Um, but as for me, I, I just don't see how you can award points to uh, someone uh, who, for example, uh, denies that Donald Trump ever said that um, all Mexicans are rapists and criminals and murderers, uh, all that, all the, or that uh, Donald Trump never said that Vladimir Putin was a stronger leader and a better leader than uh, Barack Obama. Uh, it was perhaps an effective tactic uh, for uh, Governor Pence to deny uh, that Donald Trump had engaged in uh, all of these uh, different comments. Uh, it was effective for perhaps that night of the debate. Uh, but again, I just don't see how an individual who's participating in a debate, which is supposed to enlighten the electorate, uh, could get points for uh, just being so misleading. In any event, um, uh, the main participants, Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, uh, I think it's safe to say that both have their baggage and both have their challenges uh, among the many issues that people are considering. Um, seems to break down on matters of character, trust, transparency, and honesty. Um, I think that Hillary Clinton took uh, an unfair hit. Um, and I understand the media's interest in uh, taking a position that it did, but um, recall the uh, bout of pneumonia that uh, Hillary Clinton contracted. And um, I suppose that the uh, the media was interested in having Hillary's campaign uh, immediately announce uh, that she was suffering uh, from uh, this particular condition. Um, 
seems to me to be an unfair expectation. I'm not sure where you draw the line. Uh, if, for example, uh, Secretary Clinton was experiencing uh, symptoms of diarrhea, does the media, uh, is the campaign supposed to uh, announce that to the media and share that with the media? Uh, I'm sure that people in the Clinton campaign thought that uh, whatever was ailing her, um, she would be able to deal with and overcome and didn't think it uh, important enough to have to share uh, with the public and the media. Um, and I don't think that she should have been lambasted for that or criticized for that, especially when you take into consideration uh, what is happening with the Trump campaign and the whole issue about the failure to share tax returns, which every president um, um, in recent memory anyway, um, has been inclined to do. Um, when you think in terms of uh, all what's all of what has taken place with the the charitable foundations uh, of the Trump family and the, the Clinton family, I don't think there's very much comparison between um, the magnitude of the good work that the Clinton Foundation does and whatever it is that the Trump Foundation does. Uh, as a matter of fact there are obviously some questionable activities that the Trump Foundation has been involved in. Um, consider the payment that was made um, to Attorney General Pam Bondi in Florida uh, at a time when um, she was considering an investigation of Trump University and the activities um, involved at Trump University. The Clinton Foundation, the char so-called charitable foundation made a $25,000 payment to Attorney General Bondi. And uh, coincidentally, the threat of that investigation uh, went away. Um, as far as the Clinton Foundation is concerned, it's um, absolutely established that that foundation uh, does tremendous work in terms of things like um, making sure that um, AIDS medication is accessible to uh, some of the underdeveloped countries and uh, some of the individuals around the world who would not otherwise be able to obtain uh, that kind of life-saving uh, medicine. Uh, and there are so many other things on a grand scale that the Clinton Foundation is involved in uh, that amounts to good works. Um, and certainly, uh, it's clear that none of the members of the Clinton family uh, receive any payments out of the uh, activities of the charitable foundation uh, that they're involved in. Um, the same cannot be clearly said for the Trump Charitable Foundation. And as a matter of fact, uh, there was uh, uh, some controversy about the purchase of some items like uh, a six foot portrait of Donald Trump, uh, which was paid for out of the funds of the charitable, uh, the so-called charitable foundation of the Trump family as well as um, I think it was $20,000 for the six foot portrait that was paid out of foundation funds and another $12,000 uh, for a football helmet that was autographed by Tim Tebow. I'm not sure uh, if anybody can find a clear charitable purchase, uh, a purpose, a clear charitable purpose to uh, those purchases which were made and then when you talk in terms of um, trustworthiness and honestness, honesty, um, I think the viewers will recall that uh, Donald Trump skipped one of the uh, Republican primary debates and instead um, 
profess to be raising money for uh, veterans and veterans organizations. Uh, but when he was called upon to indicate um, what happened with that money, uh, he was not able to respond. And it wasn't until the question was asked that money was actually turned over. So I, you know, I think the long and short of it is that, that we as voters and uh, citizens of the United States of America have to be very uh, very actively vigilant and uh, involved about what's taking place uh, in this presidential election. Uh, and uh, I, as a local candidate, uh, will certainly do my share in terms of getting the vote out and making sure that those people uh, who will be voting um, will be educated uh, as far as the candidates are concerned and informed as far as the candidates are concerned. And then uh, on November 8th, 2016, I suppose um, we will have to trust in God that the outcome will be uh, beneficial for us in all of our lives. So with that, uh, thank you for viewing the Senate reports. Um, and hopefully we will have you tune in on a subsequent occasion for more uh, discussion, conversation, and information about happenings in the community and at the Connecticut legislature. Thank you for viewing. My name is Jay Stam Colley, and uh, I do business as Light Source Productions. I provide professional services in the area of strategic video communications. Uh, first, what we do is we help you craft your message by using what I call the rule of the five W's, who, what, when, where, and why. We do event documentation, uh, content acquisition, full-scale productions, um, editing, and, of course, distribution uh, through our social media television network. And with social media, uh, video is more important now than it has ever been. Uh, whether you're talking big business, small business, nonprofit, church, or just an individual. Uh, let's say you, you know you you plan a, a, you're planning an event, a wedding, whatever the case may be. But but let's say a big event, uh, but no video. And you spent all this time, all these hours, uh, to put this event on. And maybe 100, 200 people attend the event. But more important than that is that thousands could attend by watching it on social media. But of course, you don't think about this until after the event is over. You can't afford not to capture it for social media. And despite what people think, I am affordable. Give me a call. Let's plan your next video project and share it with the world on my social media television network. I promise you that you will have the attention of one person, me.